Well, hi there, and welcome to Fantasy for the Ages, the show where a father and son sit down and judge things in fantasy books. That we do. I'm the son of that equation, Zach. And I'm the father, Jim. Thanks for joining us for another one of our very judgy episodes. I mean, it's all completely subjective, but we're right. (laughs) (laughs) And if this is the first episode you've decided to try, please understand, that's a little tongue-in-cheek. We are not just all (laughs) judgy-judgy. But when we're reviewing a magic system, we are ratey-ratey. That being said, we are still very cognizant of the fact that you might disagree and give a better or worse score to something, and that is okay. We validate your opinion and right to disagree with us, even if we think you're wrong. It's all good. Yeah, my dad does it with me all the time. Yes, and we still love each other. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) How much of that pause will stay after editing? So how you doing today, Zach? Oh, I'm doing okay. I am... um... Well, I'm tired. (laughs) Yes, tell us why you're tired, son. Um, So we're doing a book today as a magic system thing. It's going to be fantastic. And I had not yet read the book when we first planned to do this. So I read the book, but I hadn't finished it yet until very recently, which means I stayed up very recently, very late. And so like hours ago. Yeah, we're recording this in the morning. Kind of. It's almost noon, but not quite. And I finished it maybe six hours ago. So he, uh, you know, that's what he will do for this podcast and for you, our listeners. Yeah, I'm committed. I mean, good book. I enjoyed it. But also staying up that late on that one. No, that's because I wanted to have it done before this episode. (laughs) You know, and there's a little story as to why he had to go through that. I threw out on our Patreon page a poll Mm -hmm. as to what magic series ought we to do next. Because this is a series. We've been doing a number of these. And I put four out there, and this was one of them, Warbreaker. Uh, I think the other three Zach had read. This is the one he hadn't read yet, and it's the one that won. So So I had to read it. That being said, I do plan to read everything in the Cosmere. I'm just working my way through. So this became next. Yeah. But you seem fairly awake right now. Yeah. Uh, you might need helps. a nap later. Naps would also help. We'll see how long I last. If I start fading, I'll, I'll make it through any recording we do today. But um, <laughs> past that, maybe a nap. Okay. How are you doing? I am doing great. Today is a fake holiday. Mm-hmm. In that uh, Independence Day here in the United States is on the 4th of July, which was on a Sunday, as in yesterday for us today. And when a holiday, a federal national holiday, falls on a weekend, we take a work day off on either side, whichever is closer to that holiday. So this is Monday, and we have Monday off. Notably, not everyone and everything does that. Unfortunately. But our current jobs do. Yes. So we both have the day off and said, hey, let's record. Why yeah. not? What you drinking, Zach? Well, going with my theme of being tired, I'm not drinking alcohol. I'm just drinking straight coffee. Probably a wise choice. But I believe yours has a bit more than just coffee. Yeah, I am also drinking coffee because it's earlier in the day, but it's something called afternoon. I've posted the recipe Wait, in a picture. But on it's before Instagram. noon. I know, but by the time we're done, it will be afternoon. So it works for me. You don't know that. We could be a really fast episode today. You know, a lot of people who do listen to us, it's already afternoon. That's fair. Because we're Pacific time zone. For now. But afternoon is just a very tasty and kind of common combination for an alcoholic coffee beverage. It's got Frangelico, Kahlua, and Bailey's Irish cream mm. in it. So could you say it's an afternoon delight? It will be, <laughs> unless it's gone by then. Yeah, so that's what we have. All right, so we are gathered here today to be talking Dearly about beloved. another We're gathered here. <laughs> another magic system. But, you know, I thought we'd kind of connect on just a few other odds and ends before yeah, let's we jump into that. One of those being, you know, you said you wanted to get through the Cosmere. Yes. And what's gotten in the way of you getting through the Cosmere so far? Uh, lots of other books. Yeah, we have these to-be-read lists yes. that are pretty comprehensive. That and a resistance to start something yet. But we'll go back to that in a moment. TBRs. Yes, TBRs. You know, my TBR now is, I think, 267 books. It had been up to 269, but yeah, I, I like, knocked last a couple episode, off. Last episode, you announced it was 269. I've been reading. So, boom, things come off. two books in two days. 
creative math, maybe. I don't know. But <laughs> I think, I, okay, what I had done is forgotten to take one off. And then when I went to take oh. the next one off, I was like, oh, I'd read that too already. So two came off. So yeah, 267. Gotcha. But the way lists jump up so much bigger is when you add a series mm-hmm. that's very significant. So for instance, and I think I mentioned this last time, I added Good. three different chunks of Terry Pratchett's Discworld. Yes. And I'd also added the sci-fi series The Expanse, which was mm-hmm. another nine books. You know. And I know you had a little even further back added in space throughout the Dresden books. Yes, all the Dresden Files books are on there. Well, I'll accept the first one because I already read that one now. So, you know, it is a commitment to figure out where do you put and do you put entire series mm-hmm. in. So I certainly don't have 267 different books to read in a sense. That's the stories connect often. You could say, oh, that trilogy is really one story or things like that. Yeah. There are some that are pretty robust, though. I've got mm, at least maybe it's 12, 9, 9 or 12 Somewhere around there, books that are the last ones of the Rift War cycle Mm. that are scattered near the early parts of my TBR. I like how 9 or 12 are the last books of. Exactly. The series has over 30 books. I've read a whole bunch of them already, and now I've committed to finishing them. So that's what I'm actively on now. And I recommended that to you. Yeah, I also vaguely think... Okay, I'm going to be horribly wrong here. But I vaguely remember being like... Eight on a walk with you in California mm-hmm. and you were telling me about the books you were reading mm-hmm. without going into too much detail because a spoilers and b i was eight and you thought the content was too adult but i think at least the beginning of the rift war books the saga the cycle whatever it is i think that might have been one of them could have been just because the idea of what my brain thinks of when you say rift war makes me think of that thing and so i'm like it's been interesting and on my list for a long time it's gonna be a while before i start it yeah it's definitely one that has spanned a a lot of my adult life from when i started it to now i'm still reading it terry brooks the uh shannara series is another one that's very long that one's finally done and Mm -hmm. i have finished it but figuring out where to plug that into your tbr that's another whole thing i just there's so much that i have to read and so many things that have a little bit more of a like pressing need to read them <laughs> that I'm like, I will get to these big series and things, but I'm really late to the game. And I hate. You're late to the game. I'm 51. I'm late. <laughs> you might finish your books. <laughs> no. I might die before I finish mine. <laughs> oh, absolutely. You are absolutely dying before you finish all the books that you pick oh, no. for yourself. No. Your TBR will never be empty. Oh, that's true. I keep because you more. always add to it. <laughs> Even if you read everything that's on there now, you won't finish the list. But hey, what a way to go. With good lit. It would be lit. Nice. We are gathered here today <laughs> <laughs> to talk about Warbreaker by Brandon Sanderson. Yes. Not reviewing the book, but reviewing the magic system. Some of the reviewing of the book might slip in here and there anyway, because I literally just finished it, but it's specifically we're talking about magic. So full warning, there will be spoilers here. While we're not going to summarize the whole book, it's impossible for us to talk about this magic system in depth without spoiling some of the content. So if you haven't listened to Warbreaker or read Warbreaker, whichever way you're consuming books like these these days, you might want to jump out now. Especially because while we won't spoil everything, some of the key things that I will be mentioning are major spoilers towards the end of the book. Despite Zach having to cram well into the wee hours of the morning to be ready for this, it's really not that long a book to read. He's just been busy. So it's a standalone novel, it's not part of a series, feel free to pick it up, read it, and then come back and listen to this episode. I also have a little bit of a trouble with, I love reading, but I have trouble reading actually quickly, which is weird because I'm a fairly quick reader, but I'll sit for like 20, 30, 40 minutes reading, and then I'll start experiencing the law of diminishing returns, <laughs> where I, my brain starts losing focus on the words, and I have to get up, do something else for just a few minutes or something, and then I can come back and keep reading. Oh, I get that. It's difficult. I also understand, you know, there are lots of people I know read much faster than I do. And I know I could push myself to read faster. But but I don't want to. I just relax into a book. And the thing is, I'm not thinking about my reading. I'm just immersed in the story. So the reading happens at the pace it happens. And that's it. There's a quote from 
ink heart that I really love. I I'd probably am not going to say it quite right, but the gist is that some books are meant to be devoured, others merely tasted, but some books, rare books, are meant to be properly chewed and savored. And, and that's the sort of thing I'm going, you can really, really quickly, or you can try something and find out you don't like it. But when it's a really good book, you want to sit down, take the time, and really enjoy it. That all said, we did both get through Warbreaker. Yes. You very recently. Yes. Me a little further back, but it's just been a few months ago. The content is fairly fresh. We're going to review now what is it about the magic, what makes the magic work of Warbreaker. It's a unique system here uh, that Sanderson has created. It is part of his Cosmere so there are certain rules that apply. It's a hard magic system, like all of the Cosmere's magic systems. Mm -hmm. But this one does things differently than anything else we've come across. So we should talk about that. So let's start with our nitty gritty basic. What is the thing that makes this magic system magic? What, what drives this force? Yes. And that's breath. Capital B, breath. Yes. Dad, what do you think of? What is breath? Breath is, well, uh, the way it's used in the book, it's equivalent to uh, a soul. I disagree. They describe it that vehemently. way, though. They describe it. Everybody has one breath. That's They're born with it. It is their natural essence, perhaps magical essence, but not everybody really knows what to do with this breath to use it in a magical sort of way. But you have it, and you can use it or give it up. If you use it, you don't really lose it because you can suck it back in. But if you give it up, it's gone and you, you can't reclaim it. It doesn't work like that. You've given it away and then you have no breath and they describe you as a drab. Mm -hmm. You The world looks different to you now. It looks drab, lifeless, blah, because tied to this breath, is how you perceive the world. And the more breath somebody has, because that's the thing, you're born with one, but you can get more. There are ways. And the more breath you have, the more alive the world becomes. Mm -hmm. Much of what you said is accurate. Some of it... Eh. <laughs> so you're telling me I'm wrong? On some things, a little bit. Well, let's talk about that. Now, the key thing that I kind of want to point out is I'm going to sit here and tell you it's not exactly a soul. And there are a number of things and reasoning as to go into this, but I think it's a little easier, especially morally, to consider it as a power that goes along with the soul. The soul is still there, but it's weak and not connected to the greater Cosmere without this. And I'll get into that a fine. little that's bit fine. later. We're, this is not a, a theological thing. issue when we talk about soul in this term. Yeah, but it, it does have, especially in world, religious contexts no matter who you're talking to because one of the driving forces in this book is how people view breath and this biochromatic ability this awakening or other beings of these natures okay now you just dropped two really big terms yes. that are part of this and, I and i'm going say to explain you them. should illuminate biochromatic is really just a word that goes along with to scientifically more describe biochromatic breath it's the more proper term and there's a reason why it is that and it's because this world is infused with a power that is color driven. You mentioned that the world becomes more alive with more breath. And while that's true, it's based it's, in the world doesn't come more alive. Your, your experience of it. Yes. of it. But while that is true, it is all based through this concept and idea of color suffusing the world. I actually had a little bit of a difficult time grasping what exactly this was meaning. And I think I figured out what fits with me better later on. So we experience colors, right? And what we're seeing... Unless you're colorblind. Well, even if you're colorblind, you experience something that is like color. Okay. You experience seeing light. That's more accurate. But basically, scientifically, light shines down, hits something. Most things get absorbed and whatever color is not absorbed, that wavelength reflects back to us. And that's what we see. The way I can wrap my head around it in this world is while that is true, anything that's absorbed is then basically more or less stored in that object or thing, and you can pull that color out of it in certain ways, shapes, and forms through your actions with your biochromatic breath. And mm -hmm. that's why we'll see various changes in color when you do this in a specific way. Not in a specific way. I mean, the color just disappears. It's very specific. Uh, yes and no. 
So I need to explain awakening as we're getting into this. Okay. Awakening is the process in which someone typically with more than one breath puts their breath into something else to give it a form of life. That life has a little bit of variation and it changes and we get described in the books really like four different kinds of beings more or less that could be created through this awakening. There are other rules to do with this. Might we say rather than just uh, beings, might we call it for most part you're animating something with this breath? Sure, we'll call it animating, because it sometimes gains some level of sentience, not typically. Right, that's the rare exception. But go on. So these are separated into like four types. The first is naturally occurring, and that's basically things that exist with a natural breath in them. People are born, they have a breath, all that jazz. There is the idea of the returned, which more or less someone dies, and then they come back with a more powerful singular breath and are granted different abilities by having a higher level of breath in them. We do need to discuss the heightenings, which is what these levels of breath are. Yeah, we'll get, but to, we'll that. get to that. In the book, this book at least, the returned are described as being part of that first type. Second, this is going to be what is referred to as the lifeless. And this is where it gets a little morbid. St stick with me. It's not straight necromancy. But um, you can take a dead body, something that was straight up living, doesn't have to be human, we see it done with a squirrel, mm -hmm. but something that was actually living and died, and put a breath in it. There are other ways to do more breaths into it, but it's most efficient to put one singular breath in it with specific commands, and then you can continue to order it around, it becomes a soldier, a slave, or whatever for you. A mindless, colorless thing that you control. Not direct control, though. The, the magic allows it to follow its orders without your direct manipulation of it. And these things just follow orders. So usually they get specific code words put into them to activate. And if someone else learns your code words, I mean, they could control something that you made as well. Mm -hmm. The third... Re they could reprogram it. Yes. The third type of these beings, these awakened states are if you awaken something that is life adjacent. This is something that once had a form that was living, but it isn't anymore. Think plants and other biological things that were turned into something else. Like so consider, a, yeah, a cape that's been made from wool. Wool came from sheep. It's a direct tie to something that was alive. Now you could awaken it by putting breath into it. And going a step further, doing sticks, rope, cotton, any of these various different things, it allows you to bring things, quote unquote, to life. But you have to use more breath to do it than you would something that was just a dead body. And there's an interesting thing here that the closer it looks to a life form, the less breath it takes to bring it about. Mm-hmm. In fact, it's almost ridiculous, but you take a small square handkerchief, you can breathe into that, give it a simple command, it'll do. But if you cut that handkerchief into a vaguely human shape, like a stick figure, and then you do the same thing, it requires significantly less breath to do so. Mm -hmm. That is a strange thing, but true. The last of the four types, we don't really get super described because in the book when it's asked about, someone gets told, uh, no, don't do that. Yeah, just don't do this thing. It's but a bad it, thing. It is bringing life in some way, shape, or form, animation, to an object that never was alive, be it stone or metal or some other non-living thing. And it takes an ungodly amount of breath. Yes. But that amount of breath, that much to it, does something unique then. Do we want to talk about that at all? Do we want to save that? It's never really, in like, it's implied but not said that that is actually what causes the thing that's unique. We'll talk about it later. So that was all these things about awakening. When someone uses breath to do any of these forms of awakening, it's using the breath, mm -hmm. but the breath to actually be activated draws power 
from whatever causes color in things around you. So when you've used it, depending on how much breath you're using, it impacts how much color is drawn out of things nearby. And this is where I think it's really important to view color in the way that I described. Yeah. Not in the way that we often think you're of it You're drawing as the essence of what it was that absorbed light, uh, the light waves. And the reasoning to this being when you've done it, the clothing, the objects, whatever it is, turns a gray. And they uh, stay that way. They don't get their color back later. They stay that way. However, we do see towards the end of the book, if you are powerful enough, you can draw so much out of something that it doesn't turn gray, it turns white. And therefore, my brain goes, white, it reflects all the colors, it's not absorbing. It's completely devoid of color at that point. Mm -hmm. That was just proof that you need to think of it that way sure. for me. I have no problem thinking of it that way. It's just backwards for how I usually think of color. Hmm. Probably most people. I think of how we, what we observe, not what abs what's absorbed. All right, so let's talk about how people get more breaths in this world. Because again, everyone's born with one. But there's a lot of people around in the story that have no breath. Mm -hmm. Again, nicknamed drabs. And the world appears to their perceptions rather dull. So some people are terrified of this idea of like awakeners going around and stealing your breath and doing... They can't. Specifically, and I think it's a very valuable and useful thing to know in this world, your breath cannot be stolen from you. It has to be willingly and intentionally given away. Yep. There are specific words that you can say while in physical contact with someone that sends your breath into them. Now, the reason this becomes a very significant part of the story is because of something, and we're not going to talk detail about them yet, but these entities, the returned, mm -hmm. that in order for them to remain returned, to remain existing, they must get more breath. In the story, it's laid out that once a week, they have somebody come and willing, willingly donate their breath to this entity. One way or another, they're subsisting on that breath. Yes. So we'll talk more about the return later, but because that's built in very early on in the story, we know that breath must be given. Mm -hmm. And lots of people are doing it. That's so there's lots of drabs. That, yeah. that being said, just because you've given up your breath doesn't mean you're doomed to be a drab forever. Your life isn't over. Your life still continues. There are some effects that come from this, but there is an entire kind of like commerce system around breath worked in where you can buy breath and people like sell this and have it as merchant exchanges. So even if you have given up your breath for one reason or another, if you have enough money, you can get one or many more back. Right. Now, what would be the significance to somebody to wanting to have more than one breath? That is where we first get into the idea of awakening. And because awakeners. Because you really need more than one to do anything. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you could theoretically use your one to make a lifeless and then be a drab with a lifeless, assuming you know how to do that. Mm -hmm. It's unlikely. But if you have more, you can start becoming an awakener, doing things with awakening, and at certain levels of breath, which are a little loose and approximate, you gain advantages. So this is where we're talking about heightenings. Yes, and it's quite literally a heightening to various senses or abilities that you have. So what things do we see in this series that people, what extra abilities do they gain with enough breath? For this, just to make us completely on it, I'm going to pull out a handy dandy little chart that is in the book and reference it. Because why not? Why not? And I'll mention here, he's going to go in and, and detail some of the abilities you get when you are heightened, when you have enough extra breaths. But there's a nuance here that you only have these abilities when you have all those breaths. Not when you control those breaths, it's when you physically have them in you. And again, if you use some of the breaths to awaken something, you don't have those breaths in you now. Therefore, any abilities that you had gained because you had them are temporarily gone. You may have lesser abilities or even practically no extra abilities because you've used so much of your breath out there awakening things. Mm -hmm. And until you suck those back in, you now have lost your special abilities and perceptions. So for the first level of heightening, you need around 50 breaths. That's kind of an average number. Breaths are not all equal. Some are stronger than others. They have different strengths in how much power they kind of give you. 
but that first ability that it gives you is referred to as aura recognition. Basically, at about 50 breaths, you can look out and see, oh, that person doesn't have a breath. I mean, I already could tell that because they were gray, but now I can see it. Oh, that person has one. Oh, that person is ridiculous. They must have like a million breaths or They're something. They're glowing to my eyes. And to an extent, when you get to higher levels, you kind of do glow. You don't, but you cause things around you to become brighter in color. It's a weird effect that the stronger you are, the more breaths you have, the colors around you react to that. And you can see them brighten or even at certain levels bend if you get high enough. So at about 50, you said. Yes. This is you. You can see the, the auras. Okay. That doesn't sound like all that powerful a power. It's a base level thing that it's... oh, I can tell this about other people. Now, and a significance, of course, is mm -hmm. you therefore know who around you has the ability maybe to be awakening things mm -hmm. because they have this and, and thus they are someone you need to pay a little more attention to. They might be dangerous, potentially. The next really level, it's a jump all the way up to about 200. Okay. And the second level, you gain something that I love, that this is just something you can gain through, like, magical means. It's perfect pitch. And not just perfect pitch, but, like, you can hear exactly what tones people's voices are at, figure that out, and how far off they are from specific key notes and stuff. It's really cool for my musician brain. Now, what I thought found interesting there is a regular piece of music listened to by a regular person can sound great even though it's not it might be just a hair off in certain notes and stuff and no one's going to notice somebody with this ability they're going to notice so that music won't be appreciated as well However, they need music to be far more attuned and specific someone who has this could make music that is more attuned and specific and would be extra pleasing to the ears of everyone true and the reason that I mentioned that is because this next level gets used in that kind of way. The third level is about 600-ish breaths, and you get perfect color recognition. Apparently, there are perfect colors, true forms of, like, blue. This is true blue. And you can tell how far off it is, how many degrees of hue is it off from blue. And so, like, an artist who has this can be so much more precise and perfect. But you know, that has to be 100% true, that there is a perfect blue. Because you've got red, yellow, blue, your primary colors. And if you're a little closer to yellow or a little closer to red, you're not perfect blue. But if you're right smack in between, perfect. Let's just hope we understand color theory like we do and it actually is true. Because otherwise, that doesn't make sense. No, I think we nailed that one. And then you've got the secondary colors, and same thing. You'll have a perfect green that's right smack in the middle between the perfect blue and the perfect yellow. There is a point. Most of us couldn't tell. Oh well, yeah, it looks pretty green. But someone with this ability can know this is perfect green. Mm -hmm. The next level, we jump all the way to about a thousand breaths. And this gives you perfect life recognition. What does that mean? It's something we haven't really talked about. But it does, on a minor level, happen at all of the heightenings before this. And that's, you can more or less sense other people. Really, you're sensing there are the breaths. And it's like that, it's described as that feeling. Like when you have someone who's watching you and you can't see them, but you like, you have this feeling you're being watched. It's described as that, except real. It's not like, oh, I just feel like I'm being watched. And well, there's no one there. But rather, you have enough of this ability in you and you're like, I feel like I'm being watched. You look around and, yep, there's someone staring at you. Notably, this ability allows you to be more in tune and tell where people are and sense some things within at least certain radiuses of you, especially as you get more powerful. But you can't sense drabs, or lifeless for that matter. Things that are not truly alive or don't have a breath at all. Okay. Just don't ping for you. Is there another higher level? Yeah. We get to the fifth. This is the level at which these returned start at with their one massive breath. Yes, it's described as being deific. So before we then go into the higher levels, we need to talk about the returned because the higher levels are going to mostly apply to the returned. Mostly. Yeah, others can potentially get there, but, but it's a takes heck of a lot so of breath. So many breath. Whereas to the, get there. the returned have a jump start, a head start. So, all right, the returned. This world does not truly understand why the returned happens. 
It just is. And they've created a religion around it. And I get the sense it hasn't always happened. It just, it started happening at one point. Yeah, it gets described that about 400 years before the start of our story. Right. The first I mean, breath was there. Breath was a thing. But the returned being a thing was like, whoa. Well, and going a step further, breath being able to really be sent different places or used wasn't a thing. Awakeners were not a thing. They were learning the about returned. these possibilities, you know, but they they didn't know yet. They didn't look into this until after the first returned. So the returned, in its simplest form, is somebody dies, and for some reason, they come back. They're not a zombie, but they're not themselves either. Uh, they don't remember their past life. They are just a being now, but a being with a massive amount of breath and physical change. Anything uh, about them that they had before is still there, but enhanced, made perfect. They are, you know, all their physical attributes are the, the prototype of what excellence now will be. They have perfect musculature. Mm-hmm. They are gorgeous. They're also really big. Yes, they're uber-sized. And, you know, as you try to picture what is the perfect shape and form and skill, it's the returned. They have all that. They don't all look identical. There is variety. But each one typifies perfection in a way. And ideal. And ideal. Very good. And in the one nation where Mm -hmm. the returned are, because the returned aren't anywhere else. They're in this one place. That's not entirely true. Okay, you can come back and contradict me in a moment, but the story has it in this one place that I remember about. This one land with the returned, uh, they have turned them into gods. Okay, they have created a place where the returned live, a central location in the capital city, and they are worshipped in the sense that every need they have is is met. They don't have many needs. Um, They have servants galore, And they have one primary focus, job, that they do. Uh, Technically, they run the country, but not really. Not really. It's kind of more of a figurehead type thing. Yeah. It could be more. That's getting more into the story than we need to. But they have, their main job is petitioners come to them every day. A line of people, and this is kind of mind-boggling, because they all come to them each of these different gods that Mm -hmm. returned uh, with a petition asking for healing. Because no matter what's wrong with a person, the returned can heal them once once by giving up their life, giving up their returnness. They sacrifice themselves. They will be no more, but that massive sacrifice will completely heal somebody being specific here a normal person can give up their breath become a drab and all is good a return gives up their one deific breath and they die the other person does not actually gain a breath but they are completely healed yep so for the most part people come day after day after day and and make their case and the return says yeah sorry about that can't help you the other <laughs> and that's it day after day after day because the moment they say you shall be healed they're they're gone the other kind of job that they really do have is they're believed to have prophetic qualities that they have some level of precognition or have experienced visions of the future and but actually yes uh... no 100 percent. it is confirmed at the end of the book both we know a how they actually come back and b that yes, they have seen bits of the future. <laughs> okay, how do they act? Well, yeah, that's true. There is some other How do being, they actually come back? There is some other being that we see for like a couple paragraphs, basically, and flashback as someone finally remembers bits as this returned, which shouldn't really happen. And apparently, when you die, sometimes this other being approaches your whatever and goes, hey... I'm going to give you some visions of the future, and uh, you could go back and be a returned if you want. And exactly what like what they're doing to do that, who knows? Who are they? Who knows? But point is, we as readers know that that is an actual true thing. And they do get to see some of the future. Nobody in this world actually knows this. They just believe it. 
and the returned they come back and they don't remember any of this typically mm -hmm. at all so it's like huh hi what's up <laughs> the other note that i wanted to throw in is that you mentioned returned are only really in this one place yes and no people do return other places um, this is the only place where they're deified, and so they are given a breath a week, and they're sustained. That's true. But and we others, do actually just, get told near the beginning. They're there for like a week, and they die. Exactly. And yeah. we hear mention of a place that is important in the story, but not really a lot of time is spent there. And it's like against their religion to let the returned live longer. And that's, yeah, that is one of the big primary themes of the story, that this country that's the the center of the story has made a choice on what to do with the returned and to keep the returned around which is seen as amoral unnatural by others on this planet as well and yeah it's it's a thing there's a lot of political co conflict and religious underties but that's not what we're here to really talk about we're just talking about the magic yes um so the returned yes they have this major dose of one deific breath you said and then they have to continue to consume breath mm -hmm. regular breath uh every week to stay alive uh, the interesting thing that does come up along the way is they can consume more than one breath oh absolutely they can consume a lot but they well, will use those breaths up as part of their living uh livingness i don't know they will slowly be consuming those it, breaths it is an unconscious unintentional thing it's just a bodily process like a metabolism yep. they consume it at a rate of one breath per week right. in this world um and whether they have one extra breath or 700 extra breaths uh they're still only going to consume one per week right and while it's not believed at first that returned can be awakeners because they consume this breath um that's a misnomer returned absolutely if they have enough breaths can also awaken things but they have to always have their deific breath or they will die. So they can awaken things with any of the extra breaths they have. Likewise, they don't have to consume one every week. This is not realized at the beginning. If they have 800 extra breaths they've managed to gain at some point, they could go 800 weeks mm -hmm. <laughs> without needing to consume a new breath to get a new breath and they'd be fine. Now, everything we're saying here about the returned and their deific breath and all that jazz is slightly skewed because we do learn that some of what we know might not be fully accurate. Characters just don't know how to use some of it. And so we don't. Mm -hmm. It's kind of l leads us to believe at times there might be a way to lose your deific breath, but not die but not that we know of. Or maybe give away all your breaths except for that breath, which shouldn't be possible that we know of because it's all or nothing. You give away your breath to someone or you don't. But we learned it, there might be more than we know. We just don't know it. Now let's take those uh, levels of where we're going with heightenings then, because now we've got the returned in the game who are already much farther along with that one deific breath that gives them this massive jump start. Yes. So specifically at that level, they get agelessness. They are effectively immortal. And so would any other person who's not returned at that level. You can't get sick, all that jazz. And while breath does improve your immune system as you go, you get to the fifth heightening, you're good. Yep. At the sixth heightening, you can do instinctive awakening. Is it at that previous one too, though, that you also will heal? Like you get a wound and it just closes up? It doesn't. I think it's say there. that specifically. You can, take, you can take physical damage and you'll bounce right back from it. Um, but yes and no. Because a return can absolutely just like get their throat slit and die. If the damage is that severe. No. Like it's severe, but it doesn't have to be big. We see a return have one little nick that is a very specific placement and they die. Well, that's right. It's, it's a specific thing. But, you know, if they had that same little nick on their arm, they'd be fine. Yeah. So you gain more resilience and all this through this. When you're effectively immortal, you're effectively immortal. Even a god can have an arrow shot through their eye. You know, yeah. No, that would probably still kill them. That's what I'm saying. Even a god can oh, you know, die you're that way. They would be fine. That's the point, you know. Oh, gotcha. But instinctive awakening just means instead of having to like train, really know what you're doing, all this jazz, you just like know how to do it. Okay. You get to the next level, we're up at like 5,000 equivalent breaths, and you can see invested breath recognition. Okay, that needs some explanation. Yes. 
Basically, when you're at that first tightening, you can see people with breaths and what level they're at. When you get all the way to the seventh, you can see objects that they put breath into. So if someone just puts some breath into something and is waiting with a command, you could see, hey, that has stuff in it. Up until this point, you can't tell. Mm -hmm. It just looks like an object. Okay. The next level, you get command breaking. So this is kind of important, but not that much. Basically, we talked about lifeless. They're given commands. They have these command words, all that jazz. But as well as anything else you awaken, when you do, you have to give it a command or commands, plural. And depending on the complexity, it takes more breath. Mm -hmm. If you're at this level, you can spend time and effort and breath and break through that and go, no. <laughs> you could just stop a lifeless and be like, hey, you're not going to listen to that person and do that stuff anymore. You're just going to stop. It takes effort. It takes time. You can clearly do it. You see, that's at the eighth level. Yes. Then we only know one being that's that high. We only know one currently in the story who's that yeah. high. There are some talked about that, or that we see who have been at that level. But throughout most of this, basically anything above like the sixth, we only see the God King Yep, at that level. And we're going to talk about him a little bit coming up. But the we're up to ninth. Yes. The ninth gives you greater awakening ability and audible commands. Usually you have to be able to be touching something to be able to command it. At the ninth heightening... Would we say invest it with a command? Sure. At the ninth heightening, you can awaken something just with your voice. You don't have to touch it. Okay. But you also, this greater awakening, that's what opens up your type four. You're awakening unliving things, metal or rock or whatever. Okay. You need to be at least the ninth heightening to do that. Rock, paper, scissors takes on a whole nother level if you can invest all of those things. I mean, Awaken you, them. Even if you can't do most of them, if you're just like third heightening, paper beats everything if you can awaken. But I'm like, if you're at the high enough level, rock tries to smash scissors, but scissors ducks. Then paper covers the rock and laughs. And I mean, there's all kinds of things going on. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Notably, the things that don't... That might have been funnier in my head. The things don't get in and of themselves stronger. They can, like, strengthen you and brace things and all that. But a rope is still a rope. You can still cut it, even if it's awakened. Okay, we've got 10. Yes. Which is the highest level. Kind of. Okay. It's the highest we know of what it kind of does. I mean, there's not anything where, okay, you're full. No, you, you can't could take go more higher, breaths. and theoretically, there are more benefits... We but just don't we know, don't know them. This is all we know of. So At the 10th heightening, you know that uh, you have color distortion. Basically, you brighten colors around you so much that white things start to give off prisms of rainbows. You create and a unicorns go galloping through. No, but oh. yes. <laughs> you also gain something that is a little complex and never really explained how it's done, but you can awaken without speaking, just doing it in your mind. That's never actually seen done because the one person who's powerful enough to do it doesn't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. But maybe in the next book. And that's the heightening levels that we know. All right. And that covered a lot of what you can do with breath by yeah. going through those levels. We've talked about the returned. At least some. Is there more you want to say about the returned? One last thing okay. that I want to mention because it mostly applies to returned, but also to a couple others. You mentioned they come back as ideal things. It's later kind of revealed because they want to be ideal they can with effort and thought control how they appear so if you come back and you're told you're a god or you're told you're supposed to be ideal you are but this is most notably seen that there is a royal line that is theoretically descended from a returned which again returned usually being dead and come back can't have kids it's theorized that maybe that's a lie Maybe it is possible, but we don't know how anymore. It's a whole mess. But this royal line then also has a magical ability of their own, kind of gaining some of that ability to control your appearance, and it takes shape in their hair. Someone with royal blood or one of these returned, if they actually knew they could do it, can change their appearance, specifically the color of their hair, and it often is something that they don't control, but if is affected by their emotional state. The royal line can do this, yeah, hair color changing with just thought or without thought. They can also grow it instantly. I mean, they just make it grow long. It Boom. does require energy to do that. So like you do it once and you're like, I'm exhausted. I need to eat. But it doesn't take breath. Nope. 
it's a biological energy. Mm-hmm. So that is something magical that is totally different. But it still from seems biochromatic. Biochromatic because it is still a biological process. Although and it is the opposite of everything else we see with biochromatic because it doesn't use up by color. Breath. But it doesn't use up color. It creates color. I think it's a little bit of a misconception of what biochromatic does. It, biochromatic really just means life color. It's driven and using color in some way, shape, or form, doing something. Maybe that's investing color in instead of taking color out of things sometimes. We don't fully understand the mechanics, but I firmly believe that the, they're still related. Okay. There's a reason why it's the returned and people descended from to have this. So I had asked if there was anything else you wanted to say about the returned, and you ended up talking about the royal line. Well, that's because the returned have this. Uh huh. They don't know that they do, but we see that they do. But the royal line, they aren't returned. No. There's something they're totally different. They're supposedly descended from a returned. Do they have any other magical ability? The royal line? Kind of. Not really. We do see one seems to be innately good at awakening, picking up faster than they should. And I, I think it's tied into that kind of training your whole life with controlling the hair. That mental process jives really well with the mental part of awakening. Hmm. Another piece of the magic system, you mentioned it earlier, and it does play a part in the plot that gets revealed later in the story, is that bit that if you have enough breath, mm -hmm. you become immortal. Functionally, and, it, and it's not just the returned that are that. We have a few characters in the story that it turns out have been there a long time, though nobody knows it. They're also returned. What? 100%. Okay, th this isn't supposed to be full spoilers, but we said we could do spoilers. Vasher's Th returned. Vasher is returned? Did you forget Did the I whole thing that? where at the end he goes up to uh, Susebron and goes like, Hey, I'm suddenly massive and I'm returned, and yes, I am the guy who gave the God Kings their powers. Oh, he did do that, didn't That's he? part of where we learn. See, learned. Zach just finished it. Yeah. Remember me? It was a few months ago. That's part he of where we learn that. that returned can control their appearance. Uh... But we also saw it with Denth. When he dies, well, yeah, his hair goes color, 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 different colors, because he was controlling his appearance, and then he dies. Okay. Okay. So, yes, you would get it if you reached that heightening without it, but basically they are functionally immortal and all that jazz. But so we don't know anybody. their one breath is already the fifth heightening. We don't know anybody who isn't returned who is at that level. At least not in this book. In theory, it could happen, but we don't know. I and Zach keeps have, mentioning in yeah. this book, there is only one book in Warbreaker. It's not a series. There may be another book at some point. Brandon Sanderson has talked about that, but it wouldn't be a sequel. Mm -hmm. It'd be a, just another book in this world. I have yet to read a lot of the things in the Cosmere. I've read now Mistborn and this, but I do firmly believe that there are characters in this book that appear in other books in the Cosmere? Might be. And at least one of those in this book is not returned, but is one of our main characters. Okay. And I, I think that person might reach that level without being returned eventually. Mm. All right. There's one more thing about the magic system that I think we need to spend some time with, and yes. that's the last thing on our notes here, to talk about Nightblood. Man, I love this sword. There don't, is... tell, don't tell him he's a sword, though. He the, doesn't yep. like it. There is a sword called Nightblood. We don't know the entire background of it, but, but we know it, some. It has been invested with breath to a degree that it gained sentience. It is a kind of life form now. And we're not positive exactly that that's exactly how it worked. What we do know is this is the one and only that we know of type four thing out there. It is a thing of pure metal that has been awakened. Mm -hmm. It required the ninth heightening to do so, and a ridiculous amount of breath. And when doing so, you needed to give it still a command, like you do when you awaken things. And that command shapes the sentience. And it does not appear to be something that can be undone. No. Usually you put breath into something to awaken it, and then you can suck the breath back. But this is invested in it. It is its own entity now. It has sentience. It basically has life. Uh, it's still a sword. It needs to be wielded. It can't get up and walk away. But and it seems to be able to influence well, people. I think it's important to note, this is not the only thing you can't get breath back from. Lifeless, you also cannot get breath back from. Okay. So you kind of get two sides of the spectrum. If it's super close to something that already lived, you're giving it life again and you can't get it back. 
If it's something that never lived, you give it so much life that it becomes living and you can't take that away from it. Mm -hmm. So the command that they give Nightblood, the sword, is destroy evil. This becomes an inherent problem when a sword that was never alive doesn't understand exactly what evil is. But it's very good at destroying. Nightblood is a hilarious character in this <laughs> book. <laughs> I, I, it has a personality. It's one of the best depictions of like a sentient magic weapon, like you see in Dungeons and Dragons all the time, actually doing what it like is meant to do. <laughs> and and you kind of alluded to this, and not being innately evil, yet the things that it does can be certainly judged as very harmful. Very bad, but it has no cognizance of that because it's just being. It, it's doing what it exists to do. It does like praise. <laughs> what we kind of get a vague understanding is it can magically affect people who have some evil in them to want to pick it up and use it. Now, it's rarely ever actually drawn. It's like in a, it's in its sheath and all it takes is like unclipping it and maybe opening it just, just a little and suddenly everyone's fighting over it and they kill each other and then kill themselves with it. It's intense. But we do see it drawn once and it has some ridiculous magical properties when it's drawn. Mm -hmm. And pretty serious consequences. Yeah. Like the impact on the person who draws it is pretty harsh. So apparently when you put, maybe it's just this one in particular, but it's the only one we have for reference. So as best we know, this is what happens when you put it into like metal. It doesn't stop taking in breath, or at least as far as we know, this form of investiture, this power that people innately have. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really care where it comes from, though. It can cut through anything and makes it disappear in a poof of black misty smoke, including people or walls. Whee! Literally, some this guy stabs it into a wall and a 10-foot like radius circle gets cut out. And, and the sword just lives to do this stuff. But if you fully draw it and start using it, it also draws that from you. Correct. If you only had one breath, uh, you would quickly be in a world of hurt. If you are someone who has a ton of breath, okay, you could use the sword for a little while, but it's going to be causing a serious impact. And the breath that it's sucking away, you can't get back. Mm -hmm. It's gone. You're going to be left less. And if it sucks all of it, you die. It sucks you. You go into black poof smoke. Yeah, you really suck now. Uh, all oh. right. But it is notable, kind of just to mention, it's semi-intelligent and in some way seems to allow people to use it if they manage not to kill themselves holding it the mm -hmm. first time. I, I always got the impression from the way it's talked about that Nightblood is a mistake. <laughs> yeah. Like the product of experimenting to see what could be done. And once it was done, it couldn't be undone. So the best we can do is try to manage it and keep it close. Well, and it was very clearly a, this is a good thing. Destroy evil. It'll be great. And they just didn't have that thought of it doesn't know what evil is. Yeah. And so, oops, we're stuck with it. All right. Is there anything else about the magic of Warbreaker we need to touch on? Or are we ready to start rating this system? There's not a whole lot in the magic left that I think is necessary to talk about. I'm trying to think real fast. I think we're there. Yeah, I, I might want to throw in there. You can get around some of the rules if you are clever. For example, if you awaken bones within something, that's you can basically awaken non-living things because you're actually awakening the bones. There is a lot of you need to be smart in how you use awakening. Yes, you can use a lot of breath to accomplish something, but if you're smarter, you can accomplish something very similar with less breath. Or even accomplish a lot more with still less. Yes. All right. Well, we're going to rate this now. Yes. And again, we've got the six categories and we'll discuss them as we touch each one. But just the names are, again, consistency of definition, clarity, power, impact, practical value, and means of usage. And I thought we would rate these as how many crayons. <laughs> we're just we're opening our Crayola box and going for it. Absolutely. How many crayons shall we give each one? Oh, uh, sure. Why not? So out of five crayons, 
What do we think of the consistency of definition, the degree of clearly defined rules that are consistently followed? I'm sorry, I can't get over the fact that you say crayons. What do you say? Crayons. Crayons. You say it specifically as two full separate syllables? I don't. Well, what's wrong with you? That's, it's spell. Have you seen it yeah, spell? It, you, yeah. Crayons. And so crayon is what you're saying. And I'm like, you that say sounds weird. Crayons? Crayon. Crayon? What? <sighs> crayons. I failed. Again, I failed. Crayons. So <laughs> what do we have for this? There were a lot of rules. We were able to explain them. I think the consistency, whether it sticks to its rules, yeah, it's a five. Yeah, we don't see any rule that we truly understand that we then see directly violated or that doesn't work anymore. Or... And what I love is a lot of the times the characters think that rules are being broken or changed, but we already have seen it explained somewhere else what it really is. And so we are almost more omnipotent than they are. It's great. Yes. Clarity. How well is the magic system revealed to the reader? This one, it suffers just a little yeah, bit. Yeah, we, we could, as we were talking, we were saying, eh, we're not um, sure about some of these things. I do think it's pretty clear in what it does choose to show, but it in, kind of intentionally goes, so much of this is not understood. Right. And with being only one book, we don't explore enough to understand everything. Are we comfortable with a middle of the road on this? Give it three crayons? I was possibly going to throw it up to a four, but... I can settle for a three. Yeah, I think three. All right. Power. Just how strong is this magic? It's pretty strong. Well, considering the top level here says godlike and the <laughs> highest, strongest person is literally called the god king. And has basically omnipotent power <laughs> with, with what it can do. And even at a lower level, what it means, the difference between having a breath and not is pretty impactful on your life, typically, and your outlook on the world. So I'd say it's it's a pretty strong thing. So five what? Five crayons. Crayons, yes. Impact. How much does magic impact this world and the story being shared? Oh my goodness, it's everything in this world. And yet, it's not the only thing in this world. I will say I would give it a five. Um, I mean, what matters if you take biochromatic breath out of the picture? Kind of exactly, because most of the driving force within the narrative is actually political and or religious, but both of those things are tied to breath and how they're used. I think its impact is a five. Yeah. Yeah. Practical value. What good does the magic system do in the world? Here's where we get a little bit funky. In cases where someone is powerful with this, it can do very good things and all that jazz, it also can do very, very bad things. It's more how you choose to use it. We see examples of a world that lives basically without any of the actual magic of this. We also see an example that is very commonly in it, and both are fine. I do think it has significant value when you consider a normal person versus a drab. Mm -hmm. And we see a chapter with one person who's, or a couple chapters, a section of the book, one person who goes very dark places because they're not used to being without a breath and they're also in really bad conditions just where they are in the story. Think about, though, how much waste goes into caring for the returned mm -hmm. because they, they have this god-like deific breath and, and then constantly people are coming and donating their breath to them and I mean, what practical value is that? There's practically no practical value in that aspect but of then the magic. Also consider when a return does give their breath, heals anything. For one so, person. Is it amazingly practical and wonderful? No. Is it a vital thing? And most people can't do any of this for stuff. for one person to have one breath? I'd put it down in like a two, three, somewhere in there on most things for the practical value. But when you add in how much worse life does seem when you don't have a breath at all, I think that bumps it up to a three. Having one is practically important. I will go with you. So three crayons. Means of usage. What does it take of a person to use the magic? A lot. <laughs> you can't just easily do it. You have to learn to do it. You have to have the access to breaths to do it. Yeah. You can't just decide, I suddenly want to use breaths and biochromatic. No, you so can't. The big things are, A, you need to have breath that has been given to you mm -hmm. or that you bought and was given to you. And B, even after having it, 
you need to very specifically know how to do things, including being able to clearly and concisely and fully say specific commands that are specific enough, but simple enough to be understood by the thing that you're giving sentience kind of to for a moment. It's complex. Okay. But anyone can get their hands on extra breath. Yes. And can learn how to use that breath if taught, if given the information. So I think this fits the middle of the road of our ratings, which says requires training, but doable. Yeah. <laughs> and again, we see that. We see someone who has no training, but then suddenly has a bunch of breaths and they're useless. Yeah. At first, can, can't figure anything out on our own. But eventually they get some training, especially very valuable training, and they become pretty useful. Okay, I'm putting down three crayons for that one. This gives us a grand total of five, eight, 24, 13. if my math was right. Yeah, 24 crayons. 24 out of 30 crayons. Uh, I not, don't think it's our best, not but the it's best, not our worst. But nowhere near our worst. Sorry, Tolkien. Again, hard versus soft magic systems. The we hard really ones are always going to do better on a rating rubric. Doesn't mean it truly is better than the other ones. It's on our subjective scale. Mm -hmm. We're giving this higher points. So 24. I'm writing that down for posterity. Let it be so. I will also kind of throw out there my own personal subjectiveness. I think this magic system is interesting. It's not my favorite. I think my favorite thing about it is Nightblood. And we don't really know enough. And it's just because I really enjoy it both as the magic part and as a character. There's a lot of readers, fantasy fans out there who really like this book. And yet when it was written, it's kind of interesting. Sanderson just kind of threw this one together in between projects. He really hadn't hit it hugely big yet. And he published it initially for free online. You could just download this as an interesting story I wrote. Check it out. <laughs> Now you buy it, you know, but I would say he does not believe it is anywhere close to his best work, but it's still a good story. Mm -hmm. And I agree, it's unique. I haven't seen anything else doing this with magic. So, cool. Well, that was a nice exploration of Warbreaker. Thank you for cramming so that you oh, were absolutely. able to talk about it intelligently. In fact, recall on some things better than mine. So. Yes. And I, I could go into more, but we only have so much time. That's right. That's not entirely true. We everything we put we together, have. I have to edit. Right. And long episodes mean longer editing. <laughs> We're Love good here. Dad. This is good. We're just a little over an hour. This is a good episode length. I know some of our fans are like, no, we like the long episodes. Just let it ride. And I'm like, you're not editing them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I have nothing else to share then. Yeah, I'm good. Thanks for being with us, everyone. And we'll talk to you next time. 